You'll be talking to us about managing infectious diseases in an era of globalization. Uh, after the 2003 outbreak, uh, SARS outbreak here in Toronto, uh, Dr. Khan became interested in uh, the newly emerging uh, infectious disease and the potential for rapid worldwide dissemination, as you can see on the first slide there. Uh, and uh, today he leads a scientific uh, research uh, program on glo globalization and uh, infectious diseases here at St. Mike's. And he's also founder of a social uh, benefit uh, corporation called BioDiaspora that uh, partners with government agencies to better prepare and to respond to future outbreaks of uh, infectious disease uh, threats. So uh, I hope we all enjoy we all enjoy his uh, expertise in uh, talking to us on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks for the introduction. Well, first of all, uh, let me just start out. Thanks for for having me here today. I just want to start out by saying. Um, I may be a little bit off the mark in terms of the content because I sort of directed this toward high school students. So, um, uh, but I understand that high school students are busy studying for their exams right now. So, um, so if, it, if, it's a, if it seems like it's directed at a grade 11 level, you'll kind of understand. <laughs> Um, so, you know, in fact, actually in preparing the presentation, I was starting to reflect a little bit about, well, how did I wind up in this place today where I'm studying, you know, global infectious diseases? And, um, and I have this really interesting role where I'm a clinician, I get to see patients who have infectious diseases. Um, I'm an associate professor at the university and get to do this uh, really interesting research. And then more recently, I founded this uh, company called BioDiaspora, which is actually taking the knowledge and the discoveries that are, are being developed in the lab and executing on them and delivering them to support decision making in, in a number of governments around the globe. So this is actually a really exciting thing from my perspective um, to, to be able to be in a bunch of these different spaces. So what I'm going to just do is, uh, as I sort of put these slides together, I started to think a little bit about like what's my path been and how did I get here? Again, I was putting my, my head into where was I when I was about 16 years old and what was I exactly thinking about uh, and, and how, how did it lead me essentially to, to where I am today? So I, I thought I actually would just give a little bit of some reflection on my path. I'm actually going to describe a little bit about myself. Um, there will be no home movies or anything here, but, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about my background. So here I was in high school going to this school, Tobacco School of the Arts. Um, some of you may know it, it's out in, uh, on Royal York Road, and was studying music and photography and really interested in the arts, um, and also very, very interested in science and mathematics and physics and so forth. I was probably more talented in the math and calculus and physics than I was in the arts, but that's, that's another story. Um, and, you know, struggled in some ways to decide well, what was I actually going to do when I completed school. So I actually took a year off of school. I think I gave my parents a little bit of a, a heart attack in, in leaving school. Uh, like many traditional South Asian parents, they kind of wanted me to, to go right into, you know, being a doctor or a lawyer or what, or what, ha what have you. So I actually delivered, that's not me, but I delivered mail for almost two years after finishing school. I worked for Canada Post and um, you know, was really thinking, well, what do I want to do with my, my life? Do I want to end out you know, pursuing a career in, in the arts? Do I want to uh, pursue my interest in, in science and, and math and, and, and so forth? So you know, to make a long story short, I went back to, to university two years later, very motivated, very directed, um, was able to get into medical school here at U of T, and uh, that's kind of where um, things led into the, into the current path. After finishing my medical training here, I decided to go down to the US and do um, some additional postgraduate training. So I lived in New York during uh, uh, 1999 to 2002. That's what the skyline looked like when I was living there first. And uh, a bunch of events happened at that time that I think were really very influential in terms of the direction that I've taken. One was in 1999, um, a virus, uh, now everyone knows it as West Nile virus, 
was first uh, made its arrival into North America through New York City. So some of you might remember that event. Um, some of you may not. West Nile virus wasn't here permanently. It actually just uh, has been about 15 years. And so there was this mysterious illness in New York that people thought was St. Louis encephalitis, and this was something I was involved in. And I thought it was really fascinating that a disease, a brand new disease, could hop across the Atlantic and show up in another part of the globe. It didn't exist there before, and then become entrenched in, uh, in, this, uh, in this part of the globe. So that was one very interesting thing from a globalization perspective. And then, of course, while living in New York, I was there during you know, these unspeakable events that, uh, uh, that happened during 9-11. And shortly thereafter, you might remember that um, this picture, I don't know if this picture rings a bell or is, is anything that looks familiar, but does anyone know what this uh, envelope had in it? Anthrax. Anthrax, right. So this was sent to uh, the New York Post. And anthrax was weaponized, and then no one still knows exactly where this uh, originated from, but sent through the US postal system. And uh, again, it was a really interesting insight. I, I seem to have a, a bad habit of being around these types of emerging diseases. But there were cases of cutaneous anthrax in New York. Um, and uh, th this was a recognition that uh, infectious diseases can have a really profound uh, impact uh, on a society. And so shortly thereafter, um, I decided, OK, I'm going to move back to Toronto came back to St. Michael's Hospital. I had actually been here as a clerk, as a medical student, and thought, well, you know, I finally have got over West Nile virus and 9-11 and anthrax, and then I moved here not knowing that a couple of months into the future, uh, SARS was this virus that was going to uh, have, uh, have an impact and really humble us here in this city. And it really led me to recognize that the world is changing at a pretty amazing pace. Um, and that globalization and changing the rules of how infectious diseases can, can interact um, in, in the world today. So there are a number of these forces that are coming together. We have population growth. So there are about 7 billion of us in the world today. And that number continues to increase. Uh, more of us are living in cities. About half of the world's population currently lives in cities. And it's expected over the next few decades that that'll increase to about 70%. Now, cities happen to be densely crowded environments. They happen to be places where infectious diseases can rapidly spread. They're also places where airports are, are located and where diseases can quickly jump from one part of the globe to another. Antimicrobial resistance is something that we see here in our own hospital. The Seven billion of us were consuming more antibiotics and were creating resistant organisms. And this is another very important issue that um, is, is potentially going to have a, a profound impact in, in the not too distant future. Some of you may have seen the Globe and Mail. I think it was probably this last weekend or maybe the weekend before. But there was an article on um, uh, carbapenemase producing organisms. This is a specific type of antibiotic, which is our, one of our last lines of defense, and how we're seeing these types of organisms that we have almost no antibiotics left to, to, to manage. Animal pathogens is very important because, again, of, of all of us on the planet, we're not all vegetarians. We're consuming livestock. We're encountering things like bird flu. We're disrupting wildlife ecosystems and coming in contact with diseases like SARS, like HIV, and so forth that, that have their origins in animals. Um, climate change is also another really important factor. And so diseases that are spread by insects uh, can now start to survive and thrive in new areas of the world. If these insects can actually inhabit a new environment, uh, they can then start to spread diseases. So d dengue fever and others are now starting to expand their territory because of uh, climate change. And mass gathering, so we're all social creatures. And for things like the Olympics, which is, I think, starting tomorrow, um, we have these congregations where millions, in some cases, tens of millions of people are gathering in a small area. And this creates opportunities for infectious diseases to spread. And then finally, commercial air travel is, um, is really kind of an amazing creature. In, in, in less than 100 years, we've seen the evolution 
of this global transportation network that today carries about two and a half billion people uh, every single year around the globe. So this is something that I became very interested in during SARS because it was apparent that this disease was hopping on aircraft and moving around the globe through this particular mechanism. Mm -hmm. So this uh, network, the Global Airline Transportation Network, and this is an image here that is one that uh, I think is particularly uh, kind of an interesting image. It's the flight pass of all commercial flights worldwide in 2013. What it shows us is how the world is connected through the movements of people. I find it to be a particularly compelling image because it's really the fabric of how the world is connected. And you can see areas of the world like North America. You can almost see the physical geography of the world. Um, but, um, and, and, but this is something that's constantly evolving. This is a creature that is, is changing. It's almost like its own living uh, entity. And so I just go a little further with that metaphor and say, you know, what I understand best is anatomy and physiology. That's what my training entails. Um, and so when I think about the human circulatory system, I think of a series of arteries that are connecting different parts of our bodies. <laughs> And if I go a little further with that metaphor and say, well, this is how blood is moving through a person's artery over 10 seconds. This is a familiar type of pattern that we would see in the ICU. Um, there's a physiologic pattern that you can see. If we look at a city like, I'm just going to show as an example, Vancouver over 10 years, this is the flow of people moving through Vancouver. And so what I want to kind of highlight here is that this system ha is, it has its own anatomy, it has its own physiology. It can get sick just like a person can from uh, natural disasters or outbreaks or terrorism. Um, and so this is really what I've been focusing on studying for the last um, 10 years or so since SARS, is what does this system look like? How does it behave? And in 2009, um, we'd actually started to, to first work in this space outside of just a, a purely academic sense in 2008 and started working with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and after starting to compile data on the world's travel, so we started to look at 95% of every commercial flight worldwide <coughs> in terms of their flight schedules, in terms of the capacity of the aircraft, and then started to work with civil aviation organizations and air transportation organizations to collect about 93% of every passenger movement worldwide through air travel. So in an anonymized fashion, so we've probably captured lots of the trips that you've actually taken, and the individual movement of the traveler, including all their flight connections. We see where people boarded a plane, where they made connections, and where they disembarked. So here in 2009, Little did we know that a pandemic was going to be emerging in Mexico. We use this information quickly to try and anticipate where people are going and see if this could help us predict how the H1N1 pandemic would unfold. So it actually turned out that this isn't maybe rocket science, that where people were traveling is where the wave of the pandemic was going. But it hadn't been something that was possible prior to this because people, you need to have billions of pieces of information and to be able to analyze them quickly. So this was sort of a pivotal moment, I think, in our work. And then finally, we came up with a name for what we were doing because we just kept calling it, you know, the project and so forth and we didn't really have a name for it. So it's a pretty clunky, big name, biodiaspora, but it literally means the scattering of life. And I think that's what we were trying to to uh, capture is that this is about how living systems in a globalized world interact and what are the health, the security, and the economic implications of that. So this is where I shift a little bit and say, well now, let's think about this from the standpoint of where are we today in terms of data. And you know, big data is a phrase that's uh, thrown around quite a bit. The fact is there's a lot of information out there today that we didn't have access to five or even 10 years ago. Uh, just our data set on air travel, we have over about 20 billion flight itineraries today in our uh, lab, but we wouldn't have had access to that prior to 2005. This information didn't exist in this form uh, prior to that. So there's a world of information out there. Some of it is coming from uh, all of us have our phones, like mine's in my back pocket. You know, it's, it's almost like it's a security blanket. I actually walked out of the house this morning, turned around, my neighbor said, you're going the wrong way. And I said, 
I forgot my phone at home. And I just the thought of being at work without my phone kind of left me a little bit panicked. You know, I started to have a few uh, uh, races uh, in my, in my uh, heart rate there. So, you know, we're all attached to these devices, and yet they can offer information on where we're located, what types of things we're doing. Uh, now, on one hand, you might look at it and say that's kind of creepy. On the other hand, certainly there are opportunities to better understand and, and utilize information for uh, a social purpose and a social mission. On the flip side, the exact opposite is we have things like satellites that are constantly orbiting and 24 hours a day are scanning uh, and picking up information that can be very useful from a health perspective. So I don't know if anyone knows what this image is showing. I think it's one that's particularly beautiful. Any, any uh, guesses what you're looking at? So that's the Nile River. And that's the Nile Delta at the top of Egypt. And uh, it's a little bright in here, so you can't maybe necessarily see. Um, but it's picking up and it's looking at how much light is being emitted uh, into space at nighttime. And it can offer us some information about population dynamics. How many people are there? Um, you know, what, uh, what's the density? What's the activity in that particular area? Um, and there are, you know, not to be too creepy, but there are satellites that actually can use algorithms to try and estimate how many people are actually on the ground in different locations at different points in time. So we've actually worked with some of these satellite data, and here's just an image of how we use this during the recent H7N9 um, outbreak in China, which is still kind of simmering along a little bit. And this is looking at eastern China and Southeast Asia, uh, from space at nighttime, and this satellite was able to, to tell us the green outlines, which again may be a little hard to see in this light, um, are the provinces where on the ground eight cases of H7N9 were being detected. And this is the information age, so this is stuff we were getting literally hours after cases had been confirmed through our contacts at CDC in the U.S. government who were on the ground in, in China. So as we're getting this information, we're quickly scanning how many people are there in these provinces, uh, what's the population at risk. We also have access to global livestock production information. And so here we're looking at the production of poultry, because this is a, a disease that um, originates in birds. And so we could then start to spatially overlay information between, well, how many people are there? What do we know about the the production of poultry, where this is a potential source of this pathogen. And a number of other factors, demographics, age structure, and so forth, as well as looking at things like travelers. So going back to our travel information, we can look here at the movements of travelers um, around the globe. So this is broken down by World Health Organization region. You can see the little um, section that says America's in red. And that's showing us that about 8% of all the travelers leaving China at that point in time were coming into the Americas, about 19% of that 8% in Canada. And so this is something we produced both for the Public Health Agency of Canada and the US CDC. And then we went further and we actually looked at the individual travelers, the flight routes of direct flights through aircraft. So these are the places exactly where those flights are coming to. The circles are representing the final destinations of travelers. And this is something that can help in a sort of agile environment to prioritize where you're going to use your resources. Where do you want to anticipate the potential arrival of, of a disease? So we don't wind up in a situation like SARS in 2003, where we actually didn't even know anything was coming at us. And then you know, we have this, uh, this prolonged outbreak with uh, you know, 44 lives, about 250 cases, $2 billion evaporated out of the local uh, economy. So I'm just going to say a couple of other potential applications now that we're on the eve of uh, the Sochi games. Um, we had the opportunity to work with uh, the uh, organizers of the 2012 games in London. And this is just going to show how these types of big data sets can be useful. So what I'm going to show now is where people travel into London over five years. So it's going to be a 15 second video or so. And there are going to be bars coming off of the map. And they're going to be rising and falling. And each one of those bars reflects the number of people traveling into London over time. And on the base, you're going to see the world's temperature. Each year, you're going to see one wave is going to reflect a year of actual satellite data on temperature. So this is just a, an animation here. So you can see that wave there. That's a year. That's another year. 
the bars are rising and falling because there's seasonal differences in how people travel. And so what we do at the end of it is we pause it right at the period where the games are set and scheduled to occur at the time in the preceding year because we don't know who's going to travel until they've actually done so. And then we integrate other information like ticket sales through the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and we then start to gauge, well, where are people actually going to be coming from? And then through our partnership, we have a collaboration with Harvard University and MIT where they are involved in what we call epidemic crowdsourcing, event-based surveillance. There's a number of different uh, terms for it. But they're spending a lot of their energy on mining internet information through social media, through public-facing websites, through Twitter, and so forth. And they're, I'm going to say, listening in 15 different languages 24 hours a day for news that could potentially be a signal of an early outbreak. Because in the case of SARS, lots of stuff was happening. There were people talking about this in Guangdong, um, Guangdong province. but. Um, but none of us actually had any official information from uh, the government of China, for example. So this is something that could complement traditional surveillance and give us a little bit of an early uh, heads up that something may be happening. And then if we start to integrate them, now this is going back to the whole concept of big data. We could be scanning the internet, listening to where there are potential events being reported around the globe, and we could combine it with the movements of people. And then now we can start to anticipate, well, look, there is a case of plague reported in New Mexico. And plague actually does, there are endemic cases of plague in New Mexico. Um, so New York City, for example, an outbreak of mumps, this is a particularly contagious disease. Very strong connections into London. We also know in London that MMR vaccination rates are low in segments of the population. Lots of people are going to be crowding around during the Olympics. That might be something that would be of particular interest and could help London decide what to anticipate before um, this actually happens. And, and so this is in some ways how we can use this kind of information to get ahead of the curve. And so what we're currently doing right now is saying, well, what if we could reproduce that same model but do it for every single city in the entire globe? And could we do that 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? Um, that would have been unimaginable ten years ago, but it's not actually, not only it's not inconceivable, it's totally doable where we are today. And that's really what we're trying to create at this point in time, is uh, an early warning system that is global in nature so that any city can understand its interactions with every other city, including where there are both endemic diseases and outbreaks happening in, I'll say, real time or near real time. And just as an example of how we started to package data, I heard there are many Ryerson students. We have a lot of connections in with the Ryerson uh, Masters in Spatial Analysis program. So this is some of the type of work we're doing in GIS where we're packaging data. These little outlines here reflect the areas around individual cities on human populations, on production of different type of livestock that can be the sources of human diseases, on the distribution of insects that can transmit diseases. This is the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, on where diseases are endemic. This is plague. So where is this normally found? As well, we can overlay all of the internet uh, epidemic crowdsourcing I just mentioned a moment ago, moment ago and do that in real, uh, real time. As well as satellite data, temperature, uh, precipitation, humidity. So all these factors can be integrated, plus every one of those circles around a city, we know how people are moving to or from every other city. So every one of those spatial units, its interactions with every other spatial unit in space and time is something that's also incorporated. So now you can kind of see how you can start to put the building blocks together and have an early warning system that, to help you anticipate threats before they actually happen. Now again, going back to big data, I think you know, it's a, sort of a sexy term, it's a buzz phrase right now. I don't think big data is necessarily it's the, the, the magnitude of the information, it's well, what do you do with it? What does it actually mean? And so this is where we're spending a lot of time thinking about our domain expertise in infectious diseases and how can we configure that information so that it actually is not just throwing information at people, it's actually integrating it and thinking about what, what are the actual implications. Um, so this really involves creating a bit of a neural network. And this is to say that 
in addition to doing the science, we've been developing technology, a web-based application so that someone who's sitting over in another part of the globe can actually run this analysis right off of our servers here in Toronto. And this is just our big touch screen. It's uh, up here on the third floor, or second floor, I should say. Um, and what's really exciting is that different uh, governments are using this, the US CDC, is using it, uh, the World Health Organization is using it um, out of Geneva, and a number of other organizations, 10 countries in Southeast Asia, the European Union, um, and so we've been able to, to, to bring this technology out to others and even enable them to integrate some of their own information into it. And so we've been really privileged to work with uh, groups like the UN, uh, I've had a chance to present this at the White House, um, you know, a lot of different great opportunities to take this science and start thinking about uh, what the uh, policy implications uh, would be and to support decision making. So, again, thinking back to that I was envisioning 15-year-olds um, in the audience, I put a couple of inspirational quotes. I was kind of thinking a little bit about that. So hopefully this doesn't come across as too paternalistic here. Um, but. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to highlight is that, uh, you know, this is a quote that I like. Uh, all humans are entrepreneurs, not because they should start companies, but because the will to create is encoded in human DNA. And this is the co-founder of LinkedIn that, that mentioned this. And um, as an academic, I wouldn't have imagined 10 years ago that I'd be starting up a company. But what I realized was that in the academic sphere, there were limits to how much I could actually have an impact. I could create an idea, and then I felt I had to convince someone else to take it on, and that someone else might be very busy with their own priorities. Um, so I couldn't necessarily execute on that idea. And so this is where um, we've created a, a social benefit corporation. It's a for-profit company. Uh, it's called, uh, th this is the logo of um, B Corp. B Corp is the, the uh, entity that certifies companies as being a social benefit corporation. And what that literally means is the company has an actual fiduciary and legal responsibility to its shareholders to not be just mindful of the return on investment in cash, but also other social currencies. So it's embedded right into the DNA of the, of the structure and the legal requirements of the board of directors uh, for that company. I think it's also taking off of uh, Mahatma Gandhi's quote of be the change you want to see in the world. Um, and so I think in some ways we can still have a social mission, but leverage sound business principles to, to scale um, the impact of our work. So um, a couple of other quotes, and again, hopefully this doesn't come across as too paternalistic, but a few things that resonate with me. Um, this quote here is 20 years from now, you uh, will be more disappointed by things that you didn't do than by the ones that you did do. You know, throw off the bowline, sail away from the safe harbor, uh, catch the trade winds in your sails, and explore, dream, and discover. And this is from Mark Twain. So this is, a, this is not necessarily the founder of LinkedIn or something. This is a while back. But I think what it says is um, sometimes we can be very, very safe in what we're doing. And I spent about seven years in the US. And one of the things I found, especially when I was in Boston, I, I spent a couple of years at Harvard. and. What I found was that many of the people there, everyone there seemed to think that they were going to solve the world's biggest problems. And I don't think the people at Harvard were any smarter than the people here. I just think they had a different mindset. They just basically were swinging for the fences. Like, we're basically going to, to go all out and we're going to have a big global impact. And so I think sometimes in Canada we tend to be a bit safe. We, we want to play everything a little safe. It tends to be a bit in our culture. And, um, and it also is deeply embedded, I think, in the academic culture as well of, of safety. So, I mean, I, the only reason I mention this is I think there are moments to take risks and to take certain strategic risks. Um, and, and we are in an environment where uh, risk taking, it's not like we're doing this out of our garage and mortgaging our houses. Um, you know, we have an opportunity to take risks to, to, to go for that larger scale impact. So uh, I'm going to end here. This was more about reflecting on what the path of the individuals uh, in the room are. Um, but uh, the last quote I have here, which is a favorite of mine, is, is that uh, success isn't the key to happiness. It's really the other way around. And I think if you can really enjoy what you're doing, if you can really be passionate about what you're doing, then the rest of the story just writes itself. And, um, 
And so that's where I'm going to end today. And um, I'm happy to take any, uh, they'll just leave it there. I'll ha happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you. Any questions? Please, yeah. Mm -hmm. As, did you get the opportunity to like, validate any of your predictions? Like, were there some cases of what you thought there would be cases of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Now, in the case, maybe I'll talk first about the H1N1 pandemic and then the Olympics. So the H1N1 pandemic, we did do validation, and we looked afterwards to see exactly where did the disease go. And we found, this is something we published in the New England Journal, we found that we had about 92% sensitivity and about 90% specificity. So. 92% of the time, the places that we predicted that H1N1 would show up in, it actually did show up. And of the places that we said it's not going to go to at that t time, 90% of them, it actually didn't go to those locations. So we did have an opportunity to do this in a, in a setting where we're talking about a global event and where there's really heightened monitoring of the actual outcome. Now, in the case of the Olympics, the Olympics is a really short event. And in that instance, there were really no outbreaks. And we weren't really expecting that there were going to be outbreaks. Um, but there were three types of events that actually took place. Uh, one was there was an outbreak of something called uh, enterovirus 71 in Cambodia. There were cases of Ebola in parts of East Africa. Uh, and I can't remember what the third event was now. Um, and we had done some risk assessments on those and said, look, these are important events that could have a significant impact, but they uh, are not likely to find their way into London based on their locations. Again, Cambodia and, and East Africa were not mm -hmm. very strong connections. So we had really anticipated that the only thing that we thought might occur was a surge in measles, because measles is extremely contagious. And we know that um, you may recall the Wakefield study in the Lancet where they talked about measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and autism. And so there's been an impact in terms of vaccination coverage and immunity in the UK. So we thought, well, that might be a risk. It didn't end out occurring. But what we're doing prospectively is these types of global events don't happen every day. So we're compiling a, a list of these events and going back retrospectively and asking ourselves, well, which ones did our prediction seem to work in and which ones didn't they work in? So the validation is a really important part of, of, of what we're doing, but we're going to need cumulative experience. It's going to take us years to really build up that knowledge. And in some instances, we won't get it right and we'll learn from it and we'll try and make sure that our, our models are, are better uh, prepared for the next time. Yes. You kind of alluded to the difficulty going from having the information to actually using it for something. I was just wondering what types of things you are imagining, like policy-wise, because you can't quarantine the city or yeah. you know, like on that large of a scale. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really good question. So like, how would you envision what's the actual um, decision that this influences? Um, so I think the first thing is there are really three frontiers when you're dealing with global events. There's only three places you can actually uh, address a problem. You can either address it when it arrives in your own backyard, which is definitely much more on the reactive side. You could potentially intervene while people are moving from one place to another, or you can actually intervene at the source itself. Now, the source is always much more preventive, um, and the destination is much more reactive. So the types of analytics that we can provide, you know, in terms of source control, governments don't need us to tell them that, they, that there's a threat and they need to address it at source. That's actually something that has to do a lot with international cooperation. What we can tell them, however, is which cities and which countries have the greatest share of the risk from that particular event being in, in geography X. So a country might be motivated based on knowing how deeply connect, connected it is with the source geography. The other thing that we do in here is based on the travel movements. No one really has an appetite for closing down airports or that type of thing. And in, in practicality, it's just not feasible. People will just go around. If someone wants to get back home, they're going to find a way to get home. and You're not going to be able to stop them. Um, 
But traveler screening is something which does come up from time to time about, you know, should we actually implement screening, see if there are ill travelers, should we put thermal scanners in airports and so forth. So that's another frontier where we can offer some valuable information. And then the last is, where are the places that you should be looking? A country can't distribute its resources across the whole country. It has to make some decisions about how it wants to allocate its resources to, uh, to anticipate and to respond to an event. The other piece is apart from reacting to something that's known, it can actually be useful to start thinking about preparedness for events before they happen. And one of the areas that we're particularly interested in is can we get countries to actually start to partner with other countries and other cities that they have deep connections to as a form of self-interest? Can they actually start to build those communication networks? Can they perhaps engage in training? Can they build capacity from a public health standpoint in the country that they have or the city they have a strong connection to, not as just a way to you know, act in a humanitarian uh, manner, but to do this as a form of self-interest. So I think there are lots of opportunities to use the information apart from you know, what you might see in a movie of you know, locking down airports and people with machine guns and so forth, stopping people from going places. So, uh, so that, that's probably a bit more Hollywood, um, but, uh, but I think there are some real frontiers and opportunities for decision making. And, and I think the big hope is that uh, you know, we're all so deeply interconnected that our risks are intertwined. And allowing decision makers to understand how those risks are intertwined, I think can lead to some really exciting opportunities in terms of you know, how we manage risk in an in a interconnected and globalized uh, world. Uh, yes, please. Uh, is your model also taking into shipping or the important network of livestock and other products? So the question was about does the model take into account shipping and importation of livestock and so forth. So I'll say today it doesn't. So we're really at a stage right now where we have focused on um, satellite data, remote sensing, ground-based sensors, um, including things like we're moving now into mobile phones. Um, as well as things like livestock production. We haven't moved into shipping just yet, but the same data sets, we've already scouted them out. We uh, actually can rebuild the entire network of global uh, shipping information in real time as well, because every vessel that's over about 20 metric tons uh, from the International Maritime Organization is required to have a beacon on it. And so that information can be picked up through satellites, automated, and then dropped into, um, into this information. So we could see where cruise ships are, cargo vessels are, and so forth uh, around the globe. So that's actually, you know, as we scale into, into a company, and our, our company is only just about three months old, um, we now can start taking on things that we couldn't take on before. If I applied to CIHR and said I want to build a network for global shipping routes, they might have just said, like, that's crazy, we're not interested. Uh, but now, you know, if companies, uh, if I'm sorry, our clients say, look, this is really important to us, we can go and build that system. And that's what we're already hearing. So that's kind of the, the next frontier is to go well beyond what we have in terms of data today. Um, you know, I was just meeting with one of my staff who are incorporating wind patterns and wind data. Um, the so-called internet of things that use, that, that phrase is sometimes out there in terms of sensors around the globe. Um, and, and the number of sensors is only going to be increasing. We're trying to leverage th that type of data and incorporate it into a GIS platform so that we can analyze it quickly and easily and mix it and match it with other pieces of information. If shipping and climate was important or tweets were important with shipping data, you could mix and match them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what do you kind of see that as like a pro and a con? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, for sure, I mean, the issue, and I think it's something we're really heightened to in terms of uh, uh, in a hospital environment, privacy and, and this type of uh, this issue. And it is, it is something that I say you have to take into consideration on a case-by-case -case basis, for sure. Um, so we're not tapping into information that is uh, personally identifiable information. 
um, you know, in terms of medical and health records. But if there is information that is put out into the public domain, uh, then it is already public information and we will start to work with and, and, and utilize that information. Um, but we do, again, we are opportunistic in terms of thinking of the value that can be created, but we're sensitive to when we go through each one of these discussions uh, on a case-by-case -case basis as to is there a potential harm that could come from the use of, or the misuse of information. And, you know, technology itself is inherently um, sort of uh, agnostic on intent. It doesn't have anything to do with the intent. So just as a quick example, when I first started with this in 2009 and published the, uh, the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first group, do you want to know who was the first group that actually showed up at St. Michael's Hospital? Any guesses? The U.S. Department of Defense uh, showed up here um, in 2009. And uh, I remember it being a little awkward because I could see um, uh, 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 some of the, the CEO's office and these guys walking in military outfits coming in. And their big concern was, could someone use this to actually manufacture an outbreak remotely and actually inflict intent in another destination remotely into a city like New York by strategically doing this in some other area? So, you know, the, the, those types of things, this is something that's not public facing. This is something that we're using with reputable organizations and we're very aware of what the intent is. But you raise a really, really good point. As there's big data out there, we have to th think carefully about, you know, the first do no harm, which is something that all of us uh, as, uh, as medical and health people are, are committed to. So it's a, it's a very good point. I don't have a simple answer for you. Um, but uh, information certainly can be a double-edged sword and, and it's something we have to be aware of. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's, there's lots of work that is happening. I think the question is really, are we getting further behind or are we actually getting further ahead? In some areas, I feel like we're actually getting further behind. Um, you know, the, the, the fear of antimicrobial resistance is, I think, a very real one. And the question really is, how quickly are we developing new agents? How are we thinking carefully about our antibiotic use and misuse? to try and prevent the emergence of these um, new types of, uh, of resistant organisms. But it's actually the challenge is it's not just our issue. And I'll give you an example. In India, there is uh, something called NDM1. This is a uh, type of uh, uh, enzyme that uh, inactivates some of the most powerful antibiotics that we have available. So through th uh, things like medical tourism and misuse of antibiotics in other parts of the globe, these resistant organisms can be generated, and it doesn't have to do anything with our antibiotic hospital stewardship program in St. Mike's. And in a short period of time, a person can travel over, come basically here, and introduce these resistant organisms. We didn't necessarily have anything to do with the creation of that problem, but like it or not, we inherited it. And that's really the whole issue with living in an interconnected world, is you have to start thinking about this from a global perspective. Um, I think there's lots that has, that has occurred, but I think the biggest challenge is we're still thinking in, as states, as countries, and what is happening within our country, and not thinking enough about what is happening as a global society. Um, and that's challenging, because countries tend to want to focus internally within their own borders, and less as to problems outside that are perceived as being external. I think that's starting to change, but the question is, is it going to change quickly enough? Um, so, you know, the, the, the first slide I showed where there was like population growth and climate change and all these other factors, I mean, these are real phenomena that are coming together today. Um, and I think there are different interventions and, and there's a lot of research that's going on, but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, there's, there's two sides to this. There, there are forces coming together and there are efforts to try and mitigate the impacts of, of infectious diseases. But, um, um, you know, as, as a global society, we're going to have to sort of see how this, how this plays out. I hope that didn't sound too depressing. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I think this was a brilliant lecture, uh, Cameron. And uh, two things that I have to mention. Uh, 
uh, humans, we don't like surprises. Even though sometimes we like surprises, and, but most of the time we, we'd like to predict what's going to happen. I think uh, the success of your uh, research and, and what you've done, in addition uh, uh, of your uh, brilliant mind, is because you're dealing exactly with a problem that us humans have, to be surprised by something that we, we actually like to predict things. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, uh, I, I cannot uh, end this by not mentioning that from your previous uh, history uh, in the Canada Post, I think there's something in your genes <laughs> that delivers very well the information and as well as uh, it's interconnected to what you've done here. So your, your genes have something that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. And, uh, Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.